All right. Uh, what I want to do now is a little bit of review. This is, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we're going to have to review as we go along. Uh, lots of algebraic techniques, uh, facts about trigonometry, all these things we'll, uh, uh, re we'll, we'll uh, talk about as we come to them. Um, but uh, I do want to talk about functions because the fundamental building blocks of calculus is the function. The fun all calculus involves analysis of functions and their behavior. That's essentially what calculus is. Um, so uh, what I want to do is just quickly, uh, and I, again, I hope you've seen this before, um, I want to talk about the basic concept of the function, what it is, and uh, what's going to be important for us as we start talking about them. Um, so here's a definition of what a function is. A function uh, is a relationship between two sets. So I've got two sets. Um, here, I'm going to draw a picture here. Here's our first set. Uh, this set is called the domain. Here's a second set. Uh, this set is called the range. What a function does is it uh, makes a uh, assignment or a partnership between members of one set with the other. So and it doesn't matter. In general, these sets can be composed of anything. So here's some member of this set. Here's another member of this set. The function says this guy is going to be partnered up with this guy. And there's a direction to it. We take the domain element and find the partner in the range. Uh, here's another element here. Um, here's another element over here. So the function says this element gets paired up with this element. <coughs> now it's possible that I could have an element in my domain that has the same partner that another domain element has. So it's possible that I can take two guys, uh, I take an element from the range that will end up having two partners from the domain. But it can't work the other way around. I can't have an element in the range that has uh, sorry, can have an element in the domain that has two partners in the range. The assignment must be unique. So there is a direction to a function, and the uniqueness of that assignment is what makes the direction inherent. So again, the range can have multiple partners, a range element can have multiple partners, but a domain element can only have one partner. And so that's what a function does. Now, in algebra, of course, the sets are real numbers. And uh, the way that we represent the assignments or the partnerships is through formulas and graphs. So let's talk about that for a minute. Number one, the formula. How do I represent functions by a formula? Uh, here's our basic representation of a function. Y is e Oh, and uh, in this function, there are two variables. X and Y are our variables. Y is equal to some function of X. That's what this is. And again, uh, we pronounce, you know, F, parentheses X, F of X. Uh, that's what this says. This says Y is a function of X. Okay? X in this formula is called the independent variable. This X is a domain element. Sometimes this is called the argument of the function. Uh, F or Y, typically we use the variable Y, but F and Y are the same thing. They represent the same designation. Sometimes we use Y equals F of X. Sometimes we just use F of X. Uh, but, uh, or these two guys, depending on which one of these designations we use, uh, these are elements from the range. Y variable is dependent and it's sometimes called the value of the function. <clears throat> so uh, that's the way we make that distinction, that idea of the direction of the function. X, the independent variable, is the argument. Y, the dependent variable, is the value. If I tell you what X is, then the value of Y depends on that choice. That's where this language comes from. X can be chosen independently. Once X has been chosen, Y can only be one thing. It depends on what X is. Uh, so this is the way that we represent functions through a formula, and this is the typical notation. Now, there will be instances in which x and y are not the variables we use. We can use different variables. Uh, we can use different function names. You don't have to use f. We can use different function names. All of that is arbitrary, but this relationship between the variables is fixed. One variable is a function of the other. The independent variable is the governing variable. The dependent variable depends on what the independent variable uh, assumes. So I'm going to be using this terminology throughout the semester. Make sure you understand the difference between a variable being independent and dependent. 
Make sure you understand this distinction between argument and value. Now the value term is a little bit ambiguous because every number is a value. The x variable will take on different values, but uh, the value of a function is the dependent variable after the value of the independent variable has been determined. So argument and value is a very important distinction. Got to understand what that distinction is when we start to use it. So how is this done? How does the formula allow us to make these assignments, to make these partnerships between members of two sets? Um, well, I hope everybody has seen this before. This is an example of uh, the application of function evaluation. So here's a function. f of x is equal to an expression that involves these uh, uh, algebraic expression that involves only the variable x. Um, what is f of 0? Equal to 1, right? Where does that come from? Well, this is where I've chosen my value for the independent variable. f of 0 means I want x to be equal to 0. So I go into my equation, I replace every occurrence of the variable with 0, and then I evaluate. 0 squared is 0, 2 times 0 is 0, so this is equal to 1. And now I know who is the part, so I've got two sets. In this set over here, I've got the number 0. In this set over here, I've got the number 1. This formula tells me that 0's partner is the number 1. So that's the way this formula is used to assign those partnerships. Um, who is negative 2's partner? If I go into my domain here, here's my domain. If I go into my domain and identify the element negative 2, who is negative 2's partner going to be in the range? Well, let's see. I'm going to replace every occurrence of the variable with negative 2. What does that equal? 1, right? Negative 2 squared is 4. 2 times negative 2. So these two terms cancel. So f of negative 2 is equal to 1. <clears throat> so negative 2 just happens to have the same partner as 1. And I can go on and on all day long. Now I can't literally do all of these because there's an infinite number of real numbers. Every one of those numbers has a partner in the range. Um, I can't do them all, but there any specific value of the independent variable. Now I know how to find this partner. I just run it through the uh, run it through the uh, the machine. Right? Sometimes the function is called a machine. The independent variable is the input. The dependent variable is the output. Right, and those two, uh, that partnership comes through uh, the uh, work of that machine. Okay, so that's how it works. That's how uh, a function can be represented as a formula. Um, but we're going to be asked to do other things uh, besides this assignment of uh, partnerships between two sets. We're going to spend a lot of time doing what we're called literal evaluations, where instead of replacing x with a numeric value, we replace x with some variable expression. So the result of this is a new function. It's not going to be a numeric value. It's going to be a relationship between two functions. Um, so how do I do that? What is f for this function here? What is f of x minus 1? Well, it's a little hard to do in your head. But it's the same idea. x minus 1 is going to take the place of all the x's in the original function. So the original x squared gets replaced by x minus 1. So there's that substitution. Uh, the x here, that also gets replaced. And I've still got the plus 1 down here at the end. That still has to do its work. So here's two places where I used to have just plain x. Uh, but those two things have been replaced with x minus 1. And now I'll work this out and simplify, right? Uh, what is the square of x minus 1? What is the square of x minus 1? Okay. It's 2 distributed across x minus 1. 
Okay. Oh, and please make sure you know this. Right? Make sure you understand where that came from. And now let's see what happens here. I've got a minus 2x here that will cancel. This is 1 minus... Oh, all that cancels. The only thing I have left at the end of this is x squared. So that's not a real part... That, that, that really doesn't define a relationship between numbers. Uh, that just produces a new function from an old one. I took the original function, replaced x with x minus 1. I get a brand new function. <clears throat> so this is something we're going to be doing a lot of, uh, these, especially early on. Uh, we're going to be asked to uh, understand how these literal evaluations can be um, accomplished. Same thing here. Um, I want to replace now uh, the variable with its opposite. What does this become if I replace x with negative x? Comes this. Once again, what used to be x has been replaced with negative x here and here. Everything else stayed the same. I just did the substitutions. So, what's going to be different now? Uh, what's the simplest form of negative x? Uh, what's this, or the, the square of negative x? What's the simplest form of that expression? just x squared, right? Doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative, if I'm squaring it, it always ends up being positive. Uh, so negative x squared is simplified as x squared. Uh, here I've got a negative x, so that changes the plus 2 to a minus 2. Uh, this is the exact same as the original except for here. The only difference is uh, that's a plus in the original function, but through this new uh, substitution it becomes negative. So once again, I'm not really making a partnership between sets, I'm just creating a brand new function from an old one. Okay, so I hope you've seen this again. This is all intended to be review. I hope you've seen function evaluation before. Uh, here's what it represents. Here's what it means. It is the device that we use to create these associations between sets. And uh, it doesn't have to be restricted to that. It can also be used to generate new variable expressions. And we want to be able to do both of these things. Um, but of course, there, there's another way, to do, uh, again, as we said, functions can be represented by formulas, but formulas are restrictive in the sense that they can't really describe the whole set of relationships because I can't literally write them all down. So what we have is an alternative method for representing the function uh, in, a, in a graphic sense. Right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a picture, and this picture is going to represent the set of associations inherent in the function's formula. So here's a formula for a function. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to use this function to create a graph. Now, uh, this is what we call the plot point method. I'm going to uh, determine, uh, use the formula to determine a set of points, and then those points can be used to construct a graph. It's very inefficient. Uh, one of the things that we use calculus for is to be able to recreate graphs without having to guess how they might look through plot point methods. Um, what kind of graph does this function generate? Line. It's a linear function. So this graph is a straight line. Knowing that is very convenient. If I know it's a line, then that's going to make my process much simpler. Um, but the only reason I'm going to do this, and I'm never going to ask you to do this again, the only reason I'm doing this is to make explicit that relationship between the function's formula and the graph and how they represent the exact same um, object being described in two different ways. And so here's a typical way that we go about this. Uh, here's my independent variable x. I don't know. I'll, I'll choose three points. Um, I don't know. Let's try this. Uh, let's try negative one. 0, positive 1. Let's try those three. So there's the independent part of it, right? X is the independent variable. I independently chose those. I could have made them anything I wanted. I'm going to choose those values. Okay, what is Y equal to? Y depends on X. If X is negative 1, what does Y have to be? So all I've got to do in the formula, replace X with negative 2 and see what I get. 
And now we can describe this according to an ordered pair. In the ordered pair, x always comes first, y comes second. This association now can be represented as the point negative 1, negative 4, which can now be plotted in the plane. Here's the point negative 1, negative 4. Okay. Uh, if x is 0, what does y have to be? Minus 2. So here's a second point that I know has to be on this graph. The point, the association that I get from the formula generates a point on the graph. So there's that point. And finally, uh, if I choose x to be 1, make an independent choice. Uh, what does that make y? 0. So there's another point on my graph. 1, 0. Knowing this is a line means that I now have everything I know to complete the graph. If I didn't know this was a line, then I would have uh, a lot more, uh, this would be a much more complex issue. Uh, but now all I've got to do is connect the dots. There it is. There's the graph of the function. And this graph identifies the whole complete set of associations. Um, let me make sure. Let me see if I can talk. Um, in fact, we're going to do this here in a minute. Uh, I'll save that for a second here. Uh, okay, there's my there's my graph. Okay. Two different ways. These are two different expressions of the same thing. The formula is the algebraic expression of the function. This line is the graph of the function. These are two equivalent modes of representing the same object the function and all of its associations. The formula allows me to generate any particular set of associations. The line instantly illustrates them through uh, the properties of our coordinate system. So the algebraic representation, the geometric representation of the same thing. Okay. See if we can do this. Instead of starting with a formula, suppose we start with a graph. Can I answer those same sorts of questions? In fact, I can do a lot more. If I've got a graph to look at, I can be a lot more thorough uh, in what I say about these things. Um, here's a graph of a function. What is f of negative 2 equal to? Okay. What this means is I've got to find the point on the graph. Oh, and by the way, that's, I guess I should make that explicit up here. Please notice that every point on this graph, for example, this point here, this point is negative 1, f of negative 1. There's that dependence. Whatever x is, that completely determines the y value. Uh, this point here, this is the point where x is 0, the y coordinate is f of 0. Same thing. This is the graph where x is 1, the y-coordinate is f of 1. So every point on the graph of a function identifies the value of the dependent variable and the corresponding value of the independent variable. So uh, what I've got to do is find a point on this graph where x is negative 2. f of negative 2 will, will be whatever the y-coordinate is. So here's that point. x is negative 2. Oops. Y is also negative 2, so that's what f of x is. There. That's the other direction. Given the graph, I can make these associations. That's the way I recover these associations from the graph. Every ordered pair indicates the association. Now I know. If I know the x value, I can immediately determine the corresponding y value. What is f of 4 equal to? 2. Right? Where do I find a point? And that's the, this is where the uniqueness comes in. If there were more than one point that had a y coordinate, that x coordinate of 4, then I couldn't answer this question. But for functions, that association must be unique. There can only be one point on this graph where x is 4. So the second coordinate must be the value of the function at 4. In this case, this is equal to 2. So f of 4 is equal to 2. Um, for what values of x does f of x equal negative 2? Now I'm asking a different question. I'm not telling you what x is. This is the y value. 
how many values of x partner up with negative 2 in the range. Now I'm looking for all the points where the y-coordinate is negative 2. Right now, um, uh, there's two plates. Here's one and here's the second one right here. This point here, 6, negative 2. So what that tells me is f of 6 is negative 2. And here's the second place right here. What this tells me is that f of negative 2 is negative 2. So I can work this in the other direction if I know the y. Now, please notice in this case, I got multiple solutions. Right? There are two values here, negative 2 and 6. But again, right, these evaluations are indicated by the graph. Um, we hadn't mentioned this yet, but I hope you're familiar with these terms. Uh, how many x-intercepts does this graph have? Three. What are they? Yeah. So the x-intercepts are the point where the graph crosses the x-axis. So here's one x-intercept here. Here's one here. Here's one here. Okay. Now, when we talk about intercepts, we're talking about points. So, for example, the first x-intercept is the point negative four zero. The second intercept is at 1, 0, and the third intercept is at 5, 0. This is an important idea. The idea of the intercept has a uh, further significance that we'll start to look at as we move forward. Um, how many y-intercepts does this graph have? One. What is it? Zero, negative one. It's a point on the graph. So this point here that point is the y-intercept. Uh, these other points are x-intercepts. A function can have lots of x-intercepts, but it can only have one y-intercept. If x, what this tells me is that f of zero is equal to negative one, well, that's the only thing f of zero can be. It can only be one thing. So your function can have as many x-intercepts or none as you want it to have, but it can have at most one y-intercept. Okay, we've talked a lot about domain and range. Now we're going to be asked to actually identify it. What's the domain of this function as it's been presented here in this graph? What am I talking about? Right? The domain are all the values of x that the function can have. Can you look at this graph and tell me what values of x are allowed within this graphing space? Negative 5 is the lowest point, right, this point here. So what I'm measuring from left to right, right, the x values that determine the extent of this graph from the leftmost to the rightmost point. The leftmost point is here at negative 5, and I move over to the rightmost point right here. That extent represents the domain. So from negative 5 on the left up to positive 7 on the right. That's the domain of this function. Those are the values of x that are allowed to be part of this formula. This graph stops at 7. It starts at 5. I can't go beyond that. Please notice here I'm using interval notation. Right, that, that refers to this interval on the x-axis from the furthest point left to right. That's the interval, one-dimensional space in which those x values can be drawn. I can't pick anything outside of that interval. So uh, this is our first uh, look at interval notation. We're going to be using this a lot in this course. Intervals are a common object that we're going to want to analyze. Okay, what about the range? What's the range of this function? Yeah, now I'm talking about up and down. From the lowest point here, from the lowest point along the y-axis all the way up to the highest point. So in the end, what I'm going to have is a little box here. This little box is contain the whole function from the lowest, the smallest possible box that contain this function. So my range measures the lowest point to the highest point. So there's my range. Yeah. It's hard to write sideways on this thing. The, y, the only y values can, that can be the result of a choice from our, range, uh, our domain 
negative 4 at the bottom, positive 2 on top. So all this information about the function's behavior can be extracted from the graph. All of these evaluations in either direction, um, the identification of intercepts and domain and range can all be identified uh, by looking at the graph, inspecting it, right? Just by observation and understanding what these concepts are referring to, all I've got to do is look at it and I can see exactly how all these things line up. So once again, here's just identification, right? I've got a graph of a function. From that graph, I can recreate all the function's properties, including its associations and domain and range for which this function is defined. Now, we're going to spend a lot more time, <coughs> especially domains. Uh, now, in this case, we were able to extract that information from the graph. Eventually, we're going to want to be able to do this from formulas, and I hope you've seen that before. Uh, we're going to want to be able to identify domain and ranges, even if I don't have a graph to look at, by applying the basic fundamental properties of our number system. And the last thing I want to mention is um, uh, the fact that not all graphs are functions. I hope you've seen this before. Uh, that's what we call the vertical line test. If I just arbitrarily draw some graph in our graphing space, it's probably not going to be a function. Uh, uh, the vertical line test says that if I can draw a vertical line that passes through more than one point on the graph, then the graph can't be a function. <coughs> and it should be obvious why that's true. Uh, for example, uh, this graph here, I'm going to draw a vertical line uh, right through uh, the point where x is equal to 1. This graph passes through, or this line passes through the graph at three different points. Um, you know, here's one point where the x value is 1, and I don't know, what, I'm not sure what the y value is, but it's got some y value. Uh, here's a second place where I've got the x value being 1 and a different y value, and here's another place where I've got an x value of 1, but a third y value. If this were a function, that couldn't happen. The independent variable couldn't have three different partners. You would only have one. So this graph here fails the vertical line test. and hence it's not a function. Um, what about this graph, the second graph? Is that the graph of a function? Yeah. This graph passes the test. There is no line that I can draw, no vertical line at least, that will intersect this graph in more than one point. So this graph is a function. Okay, if it is a function, then that means it must have a domain and range. What's the domain of this function? Everything, right? These arrowheads at the top of the graph tell me that this graph continues to extend upward and outward in both directions. So if I extend that idea, this domain includes the entire number line. Negative infinity at the far end up to positive infinity at the far end. Okay, so that's from left to right. This graph extends indefinitely across the entire x-axis. It's the range of this function from, bo from bottom to top. Left to right, everything's eventually included. Even Again, I can't actually see that, but those arrowheads tell me that's what's happening. From bottom to top, how does this graph extend? Yeah. So here's the bottom and everything up above, right? These arrowheads tell me that this graph continues to rise <laughs> indefinitely as I move away from the uh, y-axis. So it bottoms out at negative 3, but there's no top to it, so negative 3 at the bottom. And please notice, once again, these domain and ranges are being represented using interval notation. Right? So up and down, this graph starts at negative 3, has nothing below negative 3, but then on and on forever in the upward direction. So if a function, if a graph is a function, then I should be able to look at it and tell you what the domain and range are. 
in this case, uh, the domain includes everything, but this does have a bottom. It doesn't have a top, it has a bottom. Okay, so that's a, just a quick review of what functions are. And this idea that a function can be represented in either of these two pr principal ways, either as a formula of this form, right, or as a graph. And example two here is an illustration of that relationship. Every, form, every function has both of these uh, possible representations and knowing one immediately allows us to recover the other and vice versa. We should be able to move back and forth between these two forms, the algebraic form and the geometric form. And once again, that's why calculus needed not, not only the geometry of the Greeks, but the algebra from the Arab world because it was both of these working in concert that is going to allow us to make a complete analysis of functions and their behavior. How are we doing? Okay, got a little more time left. <clears throat>